goon hammer gets over you. Let's check it out. But of course, first thanks to all my <laughs> thanks to all my patrons. You guys are the bomb. Don't forget, patrons get to hang out with me, right? If you want some help building lists, if you want to mess around in TTS, if you want to just talk some more hammer, patreon.com. Oops, that's not what I want. We're going over the goon hammer. Faction pack overview. We're gonna go see what goon hammer thinks. You guys should check goon hammer out. They are uh, great. Like they're a great uh, website. They have great information. So be sure to sure to go check them out. Oh, gets. Okay, so battle traits. So under the light of the bad moon is is a little bit different. Um, it moves through the battlefield the same, but one thing that's different is the buffs that it gives. So to Squigs, it does give run a charge, it lets you re-roll their move. Um, moon Clan units, non-Squig Moon Clan units add three to the control score. So this isn't per model, this is the total. Um, Trog still get plus one save and Spiders still do mortals on fives. So the, squ the Squig one got worse. The Moon Clan one got worse because it used to be rallies on four ups, right? So rallies different now, and no more run in charge for Squig. So it kind of got nerfed for pretty much everybody except for the Trogs. We're gonna see that's gonna be a general theme. <coughs> cool. Um, battle formations. So there's four: Squig Alanche. So this is the same as the Jaws of Mork, right? All Squigs get plus one attacks. Uh, when they charge, and that's the squigs, not the riders themselves. Uh, Moon Clan Scrap. Now here's one I'm not really sure how I feel about. At the end of each of your turn turns, you can pick three non-squig Moon Clan units that are in combat. So it's like, I think it's it's essentially going to be primarily stabas. You get to pile in with them, so you get to move an additional three inches, and then two up D3 mortals. And I don't know how powerful that extra little pile in is going to be. Like, moving in this game, generally, is always really strong. But they're stabas. So I think that this sub this sub faction really just lives and dies on if taking like tons of stabas and shootas, but shootas in combat aren't good, right? So they want to be stabas. I don't know what else this could be. Maybe this is going to be fanatics as well. But uh, yeah, they just get to sort of pile in. So if you have like, I mean, three times two up D three is not nothing, right? Zero plus two plus three. Divided by three, 1.67. Mortal wounds on average, so it's like four, almost five. <laughs> it's here at the end in the thing, it says if you don't have any squigs, trogs, or spider fang units, that's the only one you're taking. It's like, correct, but why would you not have squigs and all those other things? Um, so the spider, the spider one, when a skid is trying to Ragnarok, uses the uh, Realm Web Lurker. Another spider fang unit can also use this ability. And then they get to teleport in with them when they come in. So it's like you get to deep strike another unit of, of spiders. Uh, but, like, who cares? Right? So, like, I guess theoretically you could do, like, two skitter strands and then put two other units with it, but. The Skitter Strand might be the only one that's actually worth playing. So I don't know how powerful this is. Spiders are not like GW's making the spider rules bad, right? That's kind of how this how this game works. And then for Trog Herd, um, they heal D3 after they fight. So this is really strong. The Strog Trog Herd one is strong, and the Squigalanche one is strong. Both are really good. Uh, heroic traits. The clammy hand. When a goon spike gets unit rallies nearby, you get to roll an additional three dice. So an, an additional three dice is one and a half um, HP worth of recursion. 
right? Because for every die that you roll on a six up, you, or sorry, on a four up, you get a point. So if you have three dice, on average, you're going to get a point and a half. So it means that if you are a one wound unit, like Moon Clan Stabas or something, you're going to recur another one on average. And if you're a two wound unit, you're going to recur an extra, like it's basically the same thing. You're going to sort of recur it. It's like 1.75 more that you recur. So not super great. Here in the Goonhammer thing, it says it gives you a solid chance of resurrecting a trog. That pumps up to nine dice or 10 if there's a banner bearer. Trogs don't have banner bearers, so it's nine. And so on average, you're going to do 4.5, which isn't enough to roll a trog. So if you take the clammy hand with the idea of bringing back trolls, right? Remember, trolls have five, five wounds. So if you roll all of all of your dice, there's a less than 50% chance that you get a troll back. And if you're playing a lot of trolls, you're probably playing lots of healing on them. Maybe you're playing the trog herd, right? But they heal, so it's like you're you're this is just totally wasted to use a CP to try to bring a troll back. It's like don't forget, you can spend a CP to bring back three trolls if you've already lost one of your units. You know, or or two if you had units of three. So I don't think the clammy head is good. Like, Rally isn't that good. You know, Rally's not that good. Rolling six dice to he and then you get three on average. And even if you bump it up, like, even if it's 12, right? If it was 12 dice, I would still not think it was worth rolling for Trogs. You know, because it's like, yeah, sure, there's more than 50% chance you get a one back. But there's also a pretty good chance that you get nothing for your command point. Not very good. So, Clammy Hand, not good. Loon Touched. A Loon Touched wizard gets plus one to all casting, or a non-wizard becomes wizard one. The plus one to cast pairs very nice with the Cauldron Manifestation, which gives you a second cast of the wizard. Yep. This one's good. Loon Touched is good. This is probably going to be the one that I take the, almost every time. Almost every time I think I'm going to take Loon Touched. I think it's going to be a pretty magic heavy meta at the start of 4th edition. So, like, taking, you know, having a, getting a plus one to power level on a wizard seems good. No, sorry, plus one to all casting rolls. That's even better. Like, this is crazy. Like, Destruction has such good foot wizards. Like, a plus one to cast is so good. Like, we have one in, in, in Cruel Boys. There's one in Gloom Spike Gets that you can take on any wizard. And then, in addition, you can also take, um... Or in Iron Jaws, you have plus one power level. So, like, it's actually quite good. And, like, uh, Ogres have pretty good casters and stuff, too. So, it's phenomenal. I'm probably going to be taking Loon Touch almost every time. Uh, I'm not sure what I'll be doing with it exactly. But, I mean, Fungoid Cave Shaman, right? Throw it on a Fungoid Cave Shaman. Fight another day. If this unit's in combat... So, if it's your turn, you do this, right? And if it's not your turn, your opponent does all their abilities, and then you do this, and then you get into the fight. So this always happens before you fight. On a 3-up, it can immediately retreat with no mortal damage. Um, so it gets to move, I think, right? Whatever it is. Um, but, like, this is this used to be on the Mangler Squig. We used to do this on the Mangler Squig, and you didn't have to... Or with the Loon Boss on Mangler Squig, Right? This was a, a, a command trade or whatever, so you'd make him your general, and then, but he just got to retreat. He didn't have to make a roll. So now it's on a three up, so that kind of hurts. And I, it used to be like immediately after it fought. So it's like you would fight and then you'd bounce out. So to me on a three up, it seems less good, less reliable. And like, I want him to fight and then leave, but he's not gonna do that, so. It doesn't seem super great. Um, you could also put this, I guess, on like a little guy, like if you had a squig boss or something as your general. So if he does get in combat, you can bounce him away, but I don't. Like I'd rather my squig boss be a wizard one and be casting an endless spell as a way of like dealing with it. Hi. Um, so I don't know, Loon Touch to me seems to be the only one that's really worth taking. It's definitely, I think, the strongest one by far. Artifacts of Power. The Clammy Cowl. Yep. Subtract one from all attacks that target this hero. 
pretty good. Yep. So if you really want to have a big, a big squig, or if you really want to have a big troll to be your, to to like be a hero in your list and take a thing, this is pretty good. It's just going to add some, some survivability to a dankhold trog boss or to a loon boss on English squig. Right. Uh, minus one attacks. So is that to hit? Minus one to hit from all attacks. Yeah, I think that's probably just to hit. Backstabber blade, a once per game dagger that hits an enemy here when combat. You roll a two up. Um, and so it's two up d6. It's bad. Once per game. Um, roll two dice. Don't roll ones. You know, there's a 1 in 6 chance that this literally does nothing. And then, even if you're successful, there's still, like... What if you just roll a 1? It's like, cool, I took an artifact of power for 1 moral damage. Yep. It's, uh, it's not very good. Leering Git Shield. Uh, this one's actually cool. With every unmodified hit roll of 1 against the model, it deals 1 mortal wound back. So this is cool against hordes, and it's probably again going on either like a loon boss on Mangler Squig or a Trog boss, something that can take a bunch of hits, and you can like kind of move it into into position, like into like a horde of something, and then it's like, haha, I throw forty dice at you, and it's like, cool, I deal like, you know, seven mortal da mortal damage back to you before you even finish your attack. Seems pretty good to me. I wonder when the damage is actually calculated. I don't know. The lore is is uh is okay. Sneaky distraction. This is the unlimited spell. It's a 12 inch aura for enemies wholly within, and so it's quite like it's wholly within 12 is is tough. Like it's tough for an opponent for an enemy unit to be wholly within 12, especially when the opponent knows how to play around it. You know, they just kind of, like, keep a toe out. And then it's like, well, yeah. No good, right? Like, don't be holy within 12 of a get. Minus one to hit rolls for all enemies within that aura. So, I don't know... Like, I guess you could hand of Gork. You could teleport a get into this range. Most gets are on small bases. Sure, but it's like, I'm... Let's say I'm an orc player and I'm playing against you. Or is that, like, another reason why it's bad? Because they're also on small uh, small base, so they don't even cover that much area wholly within 12? Yeah, that's another good point. So, whatever. It's there. You could teleport a, a get outside of 9, and then you could use the spell. Uh, minus 1 to hit is, like, fine. It's not incredibly powerful. It used to be. Like, in gets, we used to have a spell that was all of your friendly units wholly within 12 get minus 1 to hit. Maybe that's still what this is. Is there like, there's been like official releases for this stuff. I've gone, I sort of went over them too, but I think that they're like, essentially the same. Uh, battle trades. It's so funny, people are like writing actual lists. They're ready to rock and roll. Um, and then the Hand of Gork. So it's a little bit worse than it was before. You have to be holy within 12, but then you have to teleport holy within 24 of the caster and outside of 9. It used to just be ridiculous where it was, you know, you could pick a target holy within 24. So you could just, like, cast, like, teleport people everywhere from anywhere, and that was pretty cool. But now they've limited it, and that's fine. Teleports are still really strong. You're still going to see um, this used... Primarily, I think. Um, Spore Maw. Three enemy units holy or within 12. Two up D3. This is so much better than Sneaky Distraction. Sneaky Distraction is unlimited, right? But, like, it doesn't have a ton of value being unlimited, I guess. I don't know. The only time I think this is going to be good is if you come crashing in, like, if you're a trog and people come crashing into you. And, like, they're, you're just like, okay, well, minus one to hit for you, right? Because my wizard's standing right there, so it's going to be, like, a good defensive piece. 
um, with trolls in particular, because the shamans are going to be able to like actually hang out behind the trolls. But Sporma, three enemy units within 12 inches each suffered two up D3. Like, it's pretty good. I can't imagine a world where you're using Sporma or Sneaky Distraction multiple times. Uh, Mork's Mighty Mushroom. Uh, let's, I want to read this here. Um, honestly, whenever I look at my pile of plastic that I need to paint in the cubby next to my desk at eye level so it can shame me, I think. Jeez, that's a big endless spell. Except now it's a manifestation instead. It doesn't move, but in each shooting phase releases a big spore cloud hitting nearby units for mortal wounds. More mortal wounds for each model within the short 6 inch range. Since it has a move value of 0, enemy units don't treat it as a unit so can walk right up next to it, don't have to retreat from it, etc, etc, meaning you might hit a decent horde with the spore cloud. Yep. You might indeed hit a decent group with the spore cloud. Yeah, I mean, Mork's Mighty Mushroom doesn't seem great. Like, you throw it out and then you roll dice for enemy, but like each, for up to three, I think, whatever it is, enemy units. No, for I think for each, within six, and then you roll it for each unit, you roll the number of dice equal to the models within that range, and it doesn't move. So, like, realistically, best case scenario, um, you'll get like, like people are gonna avoid it around, like move around it. So like best case scenario, it's gonna act like a bit of a speed bump, right? If your opponent can't get rid of it, he know like they know what the deal is. And so they'll just sort of, you know, maybe have like one or two models within it, you know? With terrains now, it could be annoying to place the endless ball strategically, right? So you just put it in a choke point and you're like, if you come through here, it's gonna blow up on you or whatever, yeah. Yep, I think that's primarily how it's going to be placed. You just kind of throw it in a spot that is going to be annoying for your opponent, and then if they get rid of it, whatever, and if they don't. But I think, to be honest, I think of the three endless spells, it's probably the last one that you pick. The Malevolent Moon, um, it just gives off the light of the bad moon. It can move around the battlefield. It doesn't do any damage anymore, but it's still a source of bad moonlight, which is cool. You know, it's it's good. It's good for squigs. It can sort of chase them around. Not that being under the light of the bad moon is particularly good or useful for squigs anymore. Um, and it can... Um, yeah, it can... Um, like, it's good for trog castles. You know, it's like the light of the bad moon is just going to be like right beside you the whole time. Because Scragrot no longer has his light of the bad moon. Scuttle Tide, it's a quick little thing and a very wide base to boot with an 8-inch move and 8 attacks with crit mortals in combat. It gains a 4-up ward while holding within 12 inches of an Arachnorok Spider, which is never going to happen. Right? It's a big base, and the big base is, is good. I can't imagine how endless... how uh, manifestations will impact armies who got a lore of them with their army. I mean, like, basically, like... I think we're all going to get them eventually. You know? I think we're all going to get... Whatever. Rogue Idol better be our terrain feature in Greenskins, I'm telling you guys. Um, but, um... Like... I hope that armies take their own. You know... Like, I think Gits will probably take their own if you're playing Trolls. Right? Arachna Cauldron. This little guy is just wonderful, really. The model is the best of the bunch, and also is giving a friendly wizard within one inch, plus one to his power level in your hero phase until the next turn. So it's an additional cast and an additional dispel. And if you've given your wizard plus one to cast, you're you're just a plus one to cast wizard. That's really strong. Yeah. For Skaven, it's actually a tough choice. Well, that's okay. If be, having it be a tough choice is also fine. It would just suck if your lore was really bad, like your manifestation lore for your faction was really bad, and then you were like, well, like I never take it or whatever, right? 
Well, you can probably play both, right? Like, you'll, you'll experiment with both. But Arachna Cauldron is good. Scuttle Tide is, is, is good. It's got a big base, and it does damage, right? Eight attacks, crit mortals, so it'll be doing a, a few mortal wounds, right? The Malevolent Moon is good, and then Mork's Mighty Mushroom has some utility. So you'll be casting well, probably all of these in your games, which is which is great. That's what you want, right? Um, yeah, I mean, that's it for them. Goonhammer seems to like them. So, like, I don't know. Like, I think that they're... I think the gits are looking pretty good. I don't really have any complaints or beef about them. Like, subscribe. Wow.